Our second scripture reading is John chapter 18, verses 33 through 38. Today is Christ the King Sunday, so you might keep that in mind as you listen to these words from John's gospel. Then Pilate entered the headquarters again, summoned Jesus, and asked him, Are you king of the Jews? Jesus answered, Do you ask this on your own, or did others tell you about me? Pilate replied, I am not a Jew, am I? Your own nation and the chief priests have handed you over to me. What have you done? Jesus answered, My kingdom is not from this world. If my kingdom were from this world, my followers would be fighting to keep me from being handed over to the Jews. But as it is, my kingdom is not from here. Pilate asked him, So you are a king? Jesus answered, You say that I am a king. For this I was born and for this I came into the world to testify to the truth. Everyone who belongs to the truth listens to my voice. Pilate asked him, what is truth? This is the word of the Lord. One of my favorite comic strips uh, when I was growing up was The Far Side. Did anybody read The Far Side? Is it going to be a lonely sermon for me today? No, enough of you nodding. All right, so some of you know what The Far Side is. The Far Side was a great comic, and it was always one single panel. It was never, you know, multiple. It was one panel. But one of my favorite strips, he, Gary Larson, who made it, had cut it into two. And on the top panel, it was night, and a young man was lying in bed, and you could tell that he couldn't sleep, and his eyes are wide open, and the little thought bubble above his head went something like this. Does she know I exist? I don't think she knows I exist. But maybe she does know I exist. I'm going to call her. No, I'm not, because she doesn't know I exist, but she might know I'm going to call her. Then you go down to the panel below. A young woman lies in her bed, her eyes wide open. She should be sleeping as well. The thought bubble above her head simply says, you know, I think I prefer vanilla. It's really very funny. (laughs) And the caption below said, Same planet, different worlds. I love this strip, and I think about it all the time as I go about my life in this world, and I see things that make me think, same planet, different worlds. You see them all the time. When I was in India, and we were staying at our hotel, and I looked at the buffet one night, and it had cream of crazy soup as an option for dinner. I thought, same planet, Different worlds. As I sat at Tasha's house this past week, it, week and I listened to two of her relatives argue with one another about politics, I thought, same planet, different worlds. It's all over the place. We all live in the same planet, but we come from completely different worlds. And so keep this in mind as you think back to this encounter between Jesus and Pilate. Same planet, different worlds. Right on the one hand, you have Jesus. You're all sitting in church today, so I don't feel like I need to tell you a lot about Jesus. I feel like you know who he is. But if you have forgotten, Jesus, Son of God, Messiah, fully human, fully divine, came into the world to save us, that's Jesus. On the other hand, you have Pilate. Pilate had been a Roman soldier of some distinction most likely. He was a military man. He had risen to a position of being a bureaucrat in the vast Roman Empire. He had risen to this position by being an avid social climber, by playing on favor and friendship to get to this rank. And he had one job now that he was the head of the province of Judea. And his one job was simple. No riots. That was his job. His job was to make sure that this incredibly tumultuous province didn't get into riots. And at the same time, if he could enrich himself a little bit, that was even better. So you've got Pilate and you've got Jesus. Same planet, different worlds. So then, this comes down to us today, this conflict. And we, we see the way that it played out then. 
And we can see it in the way that they speak to each other. If, if you read this carefully, if you laid it out as like a script where it's just people's lines, you can tell that they don't ever really seem to be speaking to each other. You've been in conversations like this before, haven't you, where you're just speaking past each other the whole time? Pilate asks Jesus a question. Jesus rejects the question and asks another question. Then Pilate answers the question and tries to pin Jesus down on another question. Jesus talks around that question, asks another question, finally settles in on this idea of truth. Jesus says, I have come to speak the truth. And anybody who knows the truth listens to my voice. Pilate, to perfectly illustrate our problem of same planet, different worlds, simply replies, what is truth? And that's the end of it. They sit there and they speak past each other. Jesus is trying to explain who he is. Pilate, what's he doing? Trying to choose the option which is least likely to lead to a riot. Same planet, different worlds. So here we are today, and it is one week from the beginning of Advent, so I'm going to talk just for a moment about Christmas. Because as we think about Christmas, here's what I think we try to do. We try to maintain one foot in each of these worlds. We, you and I, as followers of Jesus, we keep one foot kind of in Jesus' world and one foot kind of in the earthly realm of Pilate. And it's really easy to see what we're trying to do when you look at Christmas. Because we're trying to kind of be citizens of two separate kingdoms. And you can capture this quite easily by watching any Christmas movie, reading a Christmas story, listening to a Christmas song, or reading a Christmas book. All of these will almost certainly lead back to this one phrase which is captured near the end of said story, song, book, or movie. And it is this phrase. You've heard it before. And that is the true meaning of Christmas. You've heard this before? The true meaning of Christmas, right? And in that song, story, book, or play, or movie, what is the true meaning of Christmas? Oftentimes, it is some sort of selfless gesture. It can sometimes be an act of love, of selfless love. Sometimes, it's as simple as two people falling in love, somehow capturing the spirit of Christmas. During day one worship today, somebody said in one of the Christmas stories that they were thinking of, it was a dog that returned home which captured the true meaning of Christmas, which I think is about right for where we've landed as a society. But in any case, we have these movies and stories and images and they try to talk about the true meaning of Christmas and they try to capture it in some sort of sentimental terms for us. Let me tell you this. The true meaning of Christmas in those categories, that's Pontius Pilate in our story today. What is the true meaning of Christmas? What's the true meaning of Christmas? It's pretty easy. You already know this. You've got the cliff notes. Jesus came into the world, Son of God, in order to save us. And when we mark Christmas, what we're marking is the birth of Jesus Christ and we are looking forward to the promised return of Jesus Christ. I'm going to let you in on something that's the true meaning of Christmas. What we try to do, what we try to do, and it is to our detriment, is we try to have both of these things. We try to live as though both are equally true. That on the one hand, of course, Christmas has a deep spiritual and theological meaning, but it also has a cultural meaning. We try to believe that somehow we can be on this, in the same planet and exist in both worlds. But this is not how we are called to exist, you and I. We are not called to exist in both worlds. We're called to exist in one world. We're supposed to be the people who when Jesus speaks, recognize the truth in his voice. We're supposed to be the people who understand what Christmas is about and do not need a play or a story or a book or a song to explain it to us. We're supposed to be the ones who understand it. 
And I say this all to you, not, this is not a scolding sermon, this is not a do better now sermon. I do the same thing. When Christmas comes around, I get very excited about the season and about the decorations and about the movies and about the songs, just like everybody else does. And when I do that, when I do that, I stray just a little bit further from Jesus in our story today. I stray just a little bit further from those words about the truth, from those words about his kingdom, from the words about who he is, and I stray a little bit closer to Pilate. Is that the sound system? That's great. Hold on. Is it fixed now? Did I do anything? Okay. I have no idea what I'm going to say now. I'm totally derailed. You've done this to me by rigging the sound system to interrupt my... You did it. I know who did it. All right, let's see. I was wrapping up. Okay, we're just going to leave it like this. Here's what I wanted to say. Advent, which starts next Sunday, is a great opportunity for us. It's an opportunity for us to think about who we want to be as followers of Jesus. It's an opportunity for us to reflect on our faith, to think about the type of Christians that we want to be, to think about the role Jesus has played in our lives, and to think about the ways in which he is calling us to live. It's back, but I'm going to ignore it. That's what we get to do this Advent season, and that starts next week. And so I'm not going to stand here and tell you what you should do or what you should think. I'm going to leave those questions with you. That as Christmas comes and as you see the movies and as you read the books and as you hear the songs and as you see the plays and as you hear the true meaning of Christmas put out in front of you over and over again, let every single one of those instances call you back to the actual thing that we are talking about. That Jesus was born in this world and dwells within us and within the church, and we exist as his body. We live, same planet, one world. Amen.